Hello everyone, I hope you are doing well. I resumed the learning and evolving from past practitioner series last December. Learning about important practitioners in history, their experiences and their learning paths gives us a lot of valuable information and inspiration to follow their learning paths in practice. As explained before, the term learning from previous generations does not mean merely learning what they practiced, but it actually means to discover how they practiced. In other words, we should learn their path of practice. Today, I will introduce Chen Fake, one of the best Chen style Tai Chi masters in history, the great Tai Chi legend of the last century. But first, let's warm up with Dao De Jing commentary and Xiu Dao. Today, we will talk about two important sentences in Chapter 4. He Qi Guang, Tong Qi Chen. In this chapter, Lao Zi explained his philosophical concept of the origin of the world. Lao Zi attributed the existence of everything in the universe to Tao. Lao Zi denied the divine power as the origin of the world. He said, quote, Yuan Xi Si Wan Wu Zhi Zhong, translation, Tao is profound and deep. It appears to be the honored ancestor of the 10,000 creatures. In the translation. At the end of this chapter, he continued, quote, Zhan Xi Si Huo Chun, Wu Bu Zhi, Shui Zhi Zi, Xiang Di Zhi Xian. Translation How pure and still the Tao is, as if it would even so continue. I do not know whose song it is. It might appear to have been before God. End translation. So here Lao Zi hinted that Tao existed before God and that Tao is the origin of all things. In the middle of this chapter, Lao Zi talked about how an individual should act by Following the principle of Tao using four sentences. They are, quote, Chuo Qi Rui, Jie Qi Fen, He Qi Guang, Tong Qi Chen. End quote. Translation We should blunt our sharp points and unravel the complications of things. We should temper our brightness and bring ourselves into agreement with the obscurity of others. End translation. So, the key term we are learning today is the last two sentences, He Qi Guang, Tong Qi Shen. He means temper, harmonize. Qi means is. Guang means light, brightness. Tong means semize. Chen means dust, small or unimportant things. Put together, it is commonly translated as softening the brightness and making ourselves the same as the dust of the world. Or we should temper our brightness and bring ourselves into agreement with the obscurity of others. Lao Tzu also provided further explanation of these two sentences in Chapter 58 of the Tao De Jing, which will be introduced in the future. In China, people just used a shortened four word expression by removing the two occurrences of the word qi or its. So, He Qi Guang Tong Qi Chen instead becomes He Guang Tong Chen, soften the glare and mingle with the dust. Or blend with the dust, yet shy bright, a better linguistic structure to read and memorize. In Xiu Dao practice, these two sentences teach us that in a meditative state, energy should be harmonized internally instead of being extended externally. According to Taoism, 
Our mind is the light, and where the light goes, the energy follows. So we should light our spirit slightly and internally, not eating the space with the strong mind. So calm down the mind and make it as light as a dust. In other words, the mind is so calm that dust, which is a very light object and can be easily disrupted by a slight wind, can remain still. Again, it is an expression of Xiu practice to apply a static approach in practice. It is worth noting that between these two sentences, the first part, He Qi Guang or Temper Our Brightness, is the key sentences. So, even though there are four sentences in total, including two key sentences, He Qi Guang is the most important. To summarize, He Qi Guang Tong Qi Chen, or its a shortened form, He Guang Tong Chen, is the key concept in this chapter to explain the correct Xiu Dao method to manage the mind in the meditative state. With that, let's dive into today's main topic, the introduction of Chen Fa Ke, a great Tai Chi legend and his practice. Topics covered in today's video include First, who was Chen Fa Ke? Second, Chen Fa Ke's contribution. Third, Chen Fa Ke's practice. Four, key characteristics of Chen Fa Ke's Tai Chi. Fifth, misperceptions. Sixth, demonstration. And seventh, takeaways and inspirations. So, without any further ado, let's get started. Topic 1. Who was Chen Fa Ke? Chen Fa Ke was born in 1887 and passed away in 1957. He hailed from the Chen village and moved to Beijing in 1928 to promote Chen style Tai Chi. He was the 17th generation of the Chen family but the 9th generation of Chen style Tai Chi. His great grandfather was Chen Changxing, the 6th generation of Chen style Tai Chi and the teacher of Yang Lu Chan, the founder of Yang style Tai Chi. The Chen style frame that Chen Fa Ke practiced, called Da Jia, or the big frame, was created by Chen Changxing based on the Xiao Jia, or the small frame created by Chen Wangting, the founder of Chen style Tai Chi. Owning to Chen Fa Ke's contribution in promoting Chen style Tai Chi, he has been considered the representative of the ninth generation of Chen style Tai Chi. Chen Zhao Pi, the nephew of Chen Fa Ke who learned Tai Chi directly from Chen Fa Ke, went to Beijing for business and also taught Tai Chi there. Later on, many people invited Chen Zhao Pi to teach Tai Chi in Nanjing, a city in the south of China. That's why he invited his uncle Chen Fa Ke to teach Tai Chi in Beijing, which Chen Fa Ke accepted. So, Chen Fa Ke's move to Beijing is actually one of the most important events in Tai Chi history. While introducing Chen Fa Ke, especially since the 1980s, two terms, Lao Jia or the old frame and Xin Jia or the new frame are inevitable. Very often, the big frame practice of the Chen village is called the old frame or Lao Jia, while the big frame practice of Beijing is called the new frame or Xin Jia. Actually, the terms new frame and old frame did not exist before the 1980s. Since the Tai Chi practice in the Chen village was mainly taught by Chen Zhao Pi, and Chen Zhao Pi learned directly from his uncle Chen Fa Ke. When Chen Zhao Kui, the son of Chen Fa Ke, was invited to teach Tai Chi in the Chen village in the 1970s, people in that village 
could not recognize some movements of that routine since the form and the structure had changed after Chen Zhaopi moved back to the Chen village. So, Chen village people started calling the form taught by Chen Fa Ke the new form and the form they learned from Chen Zhaopi, the ninth view of Chen Fa Ke, the old form, since some movements were unknown to them. Check out my video titled Tai Chi Debate Chen Style New Form Xinjia vs. Old Form Lao Jia, talking about that history. Link is in the description. There are many testimonials and stories about his great Tai Chi practice. However, those are beyond the scope of this video, so let's move on to the next topic. Topic 2 Chen Fa Ke's Contribution after he moved to Beijing in 1928, he contributed his entire life to developing and promoting Chen Xiao Tai Chi. With his countless efforts, Chen Xiao Tai Chi got recognized in Beijing and gradually in the whole country. Without his efforts, Chen Xiao Tai Chi would not have reached today's popularity. So, his move to Beijing is considered a milestone in the practice of Chen Xiao Tai Chi outside of the Chen village. It is interesting to know that in Chen Fa Ke's initial days in Beijing, Chen Xiao Tai Chi was not recognized as Tai Chi because of its differences from other styles of Tai Chi back then. For example, people called Chen Fa Ke's practice Chen Jia Pao Chui or Chen Family Cannon Fist, which is the second routine of Chen Style Tai Chi. So, many people in the Beijing Tai Chi community classified his practice as a Cannon Fist instead of using the term Tai Chi. With Chen Fa Ke's continuous efforts over time, Chen Style Tai Chi, the original Tai Chi style, gradually got accepted by the Tai Chi community in Beijing. Before he moved to Beijing, he taught many good Tai Chi practitioners in the Chen village, especially his nephew, Chen Zhaopi, who later introduced Chen Fa Ke to Beijing and then himself moved back to the Chen village in his senior age to promote Tai Chi. After moving to Beijing, Chen Fa Ke educated many highly skilled Tai Chi masters in Beijing, including his own son Chen Zhao Kui, Feng Zhiqiang, Hong Yunsheng, Li Jingwu, Lei Muni, Li Jianhua, among others. After Chen Fa Ke passed away, many of his disciples kept developing Chen style Tai Chi based on his teachings by adding their own understanding which are considered further developments of Chen Fa Ke's Tai Chi. Given his open-minded attitude in teaching, Chen style Tai Chi has become a style with different characteristics contributed by different practitioners and resulted in many different branches of Chen style nowadays. Regarding the attitude in teaching, in the older days, Martial art practice was primarily used for survival. It was normal for martial art teachers of that time to be very close minded in teaching by keeping a lot of their practice for themselves and their direct family members. Chen Fa Ke realized the problem caused by this kind of attitude toward teaching and made Chen style Tai Chi practice easily accessible to society. His success, not only in practice but also in teaching, actually reflects his open-mindedness. It's worth noting that Chen Fa Ke did not leave behind a single video demonstration, however, he did leave behind some Tai Chi photos. Also, Tian Xiu Chen, one of Chen Fa Ke's students, who followed Chen Fa Ke for many years, left behind some Chen style Tai Chi demonstrations, 
and uh, his demonstration is recognized as an imitation of Chen Fakhe's senior year's practice. From Tianjiu Chen's Tai Chi video, we can imagine how great Chen Fakhe's Tai Chi practice had been. To summarize, Chen Fakhe, the best Chen style Tai Chi master of his time, contributed his entire life to teaching both in Chen village and in Beijing. His teaching in Beijing especially made Chen style Tai Chi guide not only accepted as Tai Chi, but also recognized as the original Tai Chi style. His contributions are also reflected in the practices of his students as all of those are the result of Chen Fakhe's teachings. Simply put, no discussion of Tai Chi is complete without the mention of Chen style. Likewise, no discussion of Chen style Tai Chi is complete without the mention of Chen Fakhe. So, what made Chen Fakhe such a great Tai Chi legend? That brings us to the next topic. Topic 3. Chen Fakhe's Practice There are many factors that contributed to his success in Tai Chi practice. First, he had an authentic lineage. We all know that in the old days, martial art teaching was not as open as in modern times. In other words, a martial art teacher always kept some knowledge for himself. The same situation occurred even while teaching different family members. For example, the teacher would teach everything he knew to his oldest son, but not to other children. Now, you may wonder why it was so. Well, that was just the cultural norm back then since martial arts were used for survival in Chinese history. Later on, it became an art over and above a mere fighting skill. Even so, there are still a lot of details that the teacher would keep for himself, not others. Since Chen Fakhe was taught directly by his father Chen Yanxi, one of the best Chen style masters of his time, his father did not hold back any knowledge when teaching his son. By the way, Chen Yanxi was invited to teach Tai Chi at Yuan Shikai's home. Yuan Shikai was the first president of the Republic of China in 1912. Chen Fakhe was extremely dedicated to his practice. Since he started practicing his family art in his teenager years, comparatively late according to the old standard, he practiced many times per day. According to testimonials, he practiced 60 times per day. In other words, his daily life was just practicing Tai Chi. This number may be a bit exaggerated, regardless, he worked very hard to improve his skill. Even after he moved to Beijing, he continued to practice Tai Chi for many hours every day in order to improve his practice. Hong Junsheng, one of Chen Fakhe's best disciples, said that wherever Chen Fakhe lived, two lines of bricks on the ground would always get destroyed due to his practice Tai Chi. Yes, Chen Fakhe's Tai Chi was great. In addition, he also trained for physical strength. For example, he used heavy metal weapons as a way to train his strength. When others only emphasized internal strength, Chen Fakhe also improved his physical strength and applied it to his Tai Chi practice. In the old days, training Tai Chi with a heavy martial art weapon was a common approach, but in modern times, it has been widely neglected by many practitioners, which should be corrected in the future if one is to follow Chen Fakhe's practice. Also, I'd like to point out that after Chen Fakhe moved to Beijing, 
He continued to improve his Tai Chi practice with time due to the competitive environment of the martial art community. Beijing had been the capital of China for years. Yang style Tai Chi was the first style of Tai Chi taught outside of the Chen village. Even more interesting was that there were also other styles of Tai Chi such as Wu style, Wu Hao style and so on, which made the Tai Chi teaching profession competitive. A professional Tai Chi teacher was required to constantly improve himself in order to remain competitive and successful in that type of environment. Chen Fa Ke improved not only in practice but also in teaching. For example, he made some improvements by adjusting his previous posture to a more practical one, thus reflecting his constant efforts dedicated toward Tai Chi. To summarize, having an authentic lineage, dedicating himself extremely to training, and strengthening his body with heavy weapons were some of the key success factors of his Tai Chi achievement. So, what are some key characteristics of Chen Fa Ke's Tai Chi? That brings us to the next topic. Topic 4. Key Characteristics of Chen Fa Ke's Tai Chi A great practice should be analyzed based on its technical characteristics. I'd like to describe Chen Fa Ke's practice in the following words. Extendedness, straightness, smoothness, and stability. We can realize those characteristics and advantages of a Chen Fa Ke's structure by analyzing his Tai Chi photos and the demonstrations left behind by his students, especially Tian Xiu Chen's video. Now, let me explain all four characteristics one by one. First, extendedness. Chen Fa Ke's Tai Chi was the Da Jia O big frame form developed by Chen Changxing. This form applies an extended body structure compared to the compact Tai Chi body structure. This type of Chen style has an obvious extending motion in handling the overall movements, which makes Tai Chi Fa Jin or Tai Chi power release more penetrative. Please watch a couple of the Chen Fa Ke's photos, which illustrate the extendedness of his style. Second, straightness. Chen Fa Ke's Tai Chi body structure is the naturally relaxed but extended approach. This style emphasizes on the body straightness. However, the straightness is not managed by the practitioner's back posture but by the relaxed state of the hips. So, sinking the hips downward in a relaxed state is the prerequisite of this body structure. Also, it is worth noting that Chen Fa Ke's big frame Tai Chi emphasized a straight back at the end of each movement. In other words, the body can still lean forward or sideways during power generation. Please look at a couple of Chen Fa Ke's photo and you will notice these characteristics. Third, smoothness. Chen Fa Ke's form emphasizes the smoothness of energy transfer between two movements. To reach this level, it is important to focus on the energy transformation instead of focusing on the mechanical changes between two physical movements. It is also very important for a smooth transition between any two movements in a circular manner, which reflects one of the most critical Tai Chi principles, the foundation of a Chen style silk reeling energy. Fourth, stability. Chen Fa Ke's Tai Chi extended posture makes the low and straight stance possible. Also, it requires a practitioner to handle weight shifting movements carefully. In order to do so, body stability, especially in a dynamic state, for example, one stepping forward, 
weight transfer should occur after the stance has already stabilized. This gradual weight shifting practice not only requires dynamic stability but, in fact, also makes it possible. Please look at a couple of Chen Fakers photo and you can notice these characteristics. To summarize, Chen Fakers great Tai Chi achievements were based on many factors. Analysis of each of the four factors will help a practitioner not only avoid unnecessary mistakes in practice, but more importantly, will help a practitioner master Chen style Tai Chi, especially Chen Fa Ke's big frame Tai Chi, much easier. So, pay attention to these words when you practice Chen style Tai Chi. Are there any misperceptions of Chen Fa Ke's Tai Chi? Let's look at them in the next topic. Topic 5 Misperceptions Chen Fa Ke's great Tai Chi practice and outstanding contributions in promoting Chen style Tai Chi in Beijing have made him an iconic figure in the Tai Chi community. However, there are definitely some misperceptions of his practice in the community today. For example, some people claim that Chen Fa Ke's emphasis on force training goes against the Tai Chi principle since Tai Chi practice should be Yong Yi Bu Yong Li or applying mind but not force. This is a misperception, let me debunk it today. Yong Yi Bu Yong Li or applying mind but not force is originally from the article titled Tai Chi Quan Shu Shi Yao. Tai Chi Quan 10 Principles. This article was documented by Chen Weiming based on Yang Shengfu's teachings. In this article, Chen Weiming listed 10 important Tai Chi principles, the sixth principle being Yong Yi Bu Yong Li. So, some people said that it is incorrect to practice Tai Chi with force, even cite this proverb to criticize Chen Fa Ke's practice. Yes, any internal self martial art, and also the external self martial art for that matter, all emphasized the word Yi or mind, since we all know that mind guides the movement. So, there is nothing wrong with emphasizing the word mind here. However, how about the Li or force component? Is it a taboo to use force in Tai Chi practice? Not at all. In any internal martial art practice, there are two types of force, Zhuo Li or stiff force and Huo Li or alive force or dynamic force. Chen Wei Ming's writing actually talks about the fourth type of force, the Zhuo Li or the stiff force. Furthermore, Applying the mind actually means to have a force, but the force here means the dynamic force, not the stiff force. So, there is no contradiction between the mind and the force or the mind and the flexible and alive force. Misunderstanding Chen Wei Ming's writing is already a mistake and misrepresenting his writing to criticize Chen Fa Ke's practice is also a mistake. Now, let me demonstrate a Tai Chi movement in the next topic. Topic 6 Demonstration Today, I'd like to demonstrate a Tai Chi movement from the second routine. The name of this movement is Guo Bian Pao. Ok, now slow motion first. Now, with the force. Topic 7 Take Ways and Inspiration. It is not that easy to introduce such an important Tai Chi figure in such a short video. 
what I have introduced were just some of his most important information about the Tai Chi legend, Chen Fa Ke. First, who was Chen Fa Ke? He was the 17th generation of the Chen family but the 9th generation of Chen style Tai Chi, who promoted Tai Chi in Beijing. Second, Chen Fa Ke's contribution. Not only he promoted the Chen style Tai Chi in Beijing, but also and more importantly, he improved that style by emphasizing the silk reeling energy practice, the fundamental practice of that style. Third, Chen Fa Ke's practice was great because of many factors, authentic lineage, extreme dedication to training, and strengthening his body with heavy weapons. 4. Key characteristics of Chen Fa Ke's Tai Chi are extendedness, straightness, smoothness, and stability. 5. Misperceptions A common misperception is that Chen Fa Ke's emphasis on force training goes against the Tai Chi principle since Tai Chi practice should be yong yi bu yong li or applying mind but not force. Remember, that is the misperception. Applying the mind actually means to have a dynamic force. That brings us to the end of today's video. Thanks for watching, see you next time, and enjoy your practice.